Let me welcome you. This is the fourth and last seminar this year in the University Seminar Series on Internet Freedom and Governance. I'm Lance Hoffman, Director of the Cybersecurity Policy and Research Institute here at GW, and my co-organizers of the series are Don Nunziato in the School of Law, Arturo Carrillo in the School of Law, Will Humans in the School of Media and Public Affairs, and Susan Aronson in the Elliott School of International Affairs, all professors here at GW. The topic of the debate today is resolved that the government should never engage in the bulk collection of personal data for national security purposes. I want to thank our sponsors who are shown on the screen up here. Uh, we have financial support from the GW Provost's Office for the university seminars. We have some financial support from the Microsoft Technology and Human Rights Center. We have technical support and live streaming from the Internet Society and our media partner, the Christian Science Monitor Passcode, their online uh, modern field guide to privacy and security. Uh, it and the Internet Society and CSPRI are all live streaming today's debate at their respective websites. Uh, if your cell phones are on, please uh, silence them now. If you're gonna tweet during the debate, we ask you to include the hashtag up there on the screen, GWIFG, in your tweets. Finally, as we start, let me give a short uh, shout out to Intelligence Squared. Uh, the inspiration for this came uh, to some extent from the I Squared debates. We're not associated with them in any way, but that series of debates about the issues of the day was the inspiration for uh, this debate here. You can see their debates on all, on all sorts of issues uh, at intelligencesquaredus.org. Okay, briefly, the tensions between national security and civil liberties are obvious in a post-9-11 world, but the basic question is not new. Controlling the actions of persons in positions of power uh, has been discussed by Plato in the Republic and ever, ever since then. Today's debate is on the topic, the government should never engage in the bulk collection of personal data for national security purposes. It's gonna take place in two rounds. Uh, and then our live audience here at GW in Washington, D.C. will vote to choose the winner. So now let's meet our debaters. And by the way, the live audience here, you should have been given three by five cards to uh, cast your vote uh, on, which you'll do in a few minutes, on what you, whether you are for the motion, if you will, against the motion, or undecided. We'll, we'll come in back and talk to you later about that uh, after the, uh, the uh, discussions are over. Okay. Starting now, uh, Lee Chen is a senior staff attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Lee is over Waverly, so people can see. Uh, <clears throat> he specializes in free speech law. He's published articles on anonymity, surveillance, the First Amendment status of publishing computer software, and information technology and children's sexuality. Lee got his undergraduate degree in psychology from Stanford and his law degree from Bolt Hall at UC Berkeley. Over to uh, Lee's uh, left, your right is Chris Segoyan. Chris Segoyan is the principal technologist and senior policy analyst with the American Civil Liberties Union. Chris was an, an, an in-house technologist at the Federal Trade Commission, where he worked on investigations of Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, and Netflix. Prior to joining the FTC, he created the Do Not Track privacy anti-tracking mechanism that's now on the major web browsers. Uh, he has a master's degree in computer security from Hopkins Johns Hopkins University and his doctorate at Indiana University focused on the role that third-party service providers play in facilitating law enforcement surveillance of their customers. Orrin Kerr, uh, next in the middle, is a nationally recognized scholar of criminal procedure and computer crime law. Before joining GW's law faculty in 2001, he was a trial attorney in the computer crime and intellectual property section at the Department of Justice. He was also a special assistant U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of Virginia. He's a former law clerk for Justice Kennedy of the Supreme Court. He's testified six times before congressional committees. Uh, a couple years ago, Chief Justice Roberts appointed him to serve on the advisory committee for federal rules of criminal procedure. Uh, Orrin, and I didn't know this until I read this uh, yesterday, has an undergraduate degree in engineering from Princeton and a master's in mechanical engineering from Stanford, but he has a law degree from Harvard. And finally, last but not least, is Paul Clark. Uh, Paul Clark is President and Chief Technology Officer of Secure Methods, LLC. 
His expertise includes network systems and security, crypto cryptographic applications, certification, key management, authentication, and auth integrity strategies. Dr. Clark was previously chief scientist for DynCore, where he was the architect and lead implementer of a system that allowed digitally signed and encrypted submission of tax data over the internet. Uh, as a member of the Federal Advisory Committee for Key Management Infrastructure, he served as chairman of the Interoperability Working Group for Cryptographic Key Recovery. Paul's undergraduate degree is in math from the University of California at Irvine. His doctorate's in computer science here at GW. Full disclosure, I was his thesis advisor. Um, arguing for the motion, the government should never engage in the bulk collection of personal data for national security purposes are gonna be Lee and Chris. And arguing against the motion are Oren and Paul. Now this is a, deb a, a debate. There's gonna be one team winning and one team losing. And that decision is gonna be made by you, our live audience here in Washington. By the time the debate has ended, uh, this audience will have been asked twice to vote, uh, once before the debate and once after. And the winning team is gonna be those whose numbers have changed the most in percentage points uh, between the first vote and the second vote. So let's register that first vote now. You've all been given uh, cards. Which card are they using, the red or the, uh, or the uh, tan or the blue or what? The yellow one? Okay. Vote on your yellow card whether you are for or against the uh, motion right now. The government should never engage in the bulk collection of personal data for national security purposes. Okay. Uh, if you're against it, uh, if you're for it, check the agree box. If you're against it, check the disagree box. If you're undecided, check the undecided box. Okay, please pass the cards over to the center aisle, if you will, and uh, we'll have people coming down to uh, collect them. Okay, just pass them over to the center aisle, and uh, people will come down to collect them. And, and where are my, there they are, this, this dashing, uh, the, these two guys here. Okay. Okay, let's move on to round one. Um, round one has opening statements. They're gonna be seven minutes by each debater in turn. Again, the motion is the government should never engage in the bulk collection of personal data for national security purposes. And here to argue first in support of this motion is Lee Chen from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Lee, you wanna use the podium? Yeah. Great. Uh, so thanks to Lance and GW uh, and my fellow debaters. Uh, and I get to start probably because I have the uh, shortest resume. The, what we're debating to be, today is whether the government should ever engage in bulk collection of personal data for national security purposes. Our position is that the government should not. This is a hard line. Some of you will agree generally, but not completely, because you worry about some dire situation that might break the rules. I appreciate that. But in our view, that's exactly why most of us were surprised and shocked to learn that the government actually does engage in bulk collection, such as the Section 215 telephony records program, which had been going on essentially in secret since 2001, uh, collecting virtually everyone's phone records in the United States and holding them for at least five years. There are a few basic reasons why the government should not engage in bulk collection. Um, privacy and civil liberties, obviously. And democratic accountability, I think, less obviously. Even if at a policy level, you might agree with what NSA or the FBI seek to do, our constitutional values require public authorization and public evaluation. And that includes the rule of law the idea that you have courts being able to evaluate according to legal standards what the government is doing. Now, um, I think there are sort of two fairly common ground doctrinal legal points, uh, at least I hope they're common ground. Uh, the first is a concept in the Fourth Amendment uh, about the prohibition on general warrants or general searches. Um, it's widely accepted, the Supreme Court certainly has been repeating this over the last few years, uh, that the main reason why the framers even uh, created the Fourth Amendment was to prevent these so-called blank check 
warrants and blank check searches that did not constrain the discretion of, ex of executive officials in actually carrying out searches and seizures. And of course, the main issue there is that those are indiscriminate, or in the words of the Fourth Amendment, not particular. Now, uh, the modern intelligence community currently seems to define bulk collection uh, as something that is indiscriminate. In a presidential policy directive, uh, it stated that bulk collection is essentially uh, the co collection of large quantities of signals intelligence data acquired without the use of discriminants like search terms or names or addresses or phone numbers or other kinds of, uh, of identifiers. And this, we think, is by definition, fits perfectly into sort of the category of general warrants that the framers intended to prohibit. So that alone ought to be enough to, uh, to, to say that we should not have any kind of bulk collection. But I'll press that just a little bit. Within that notion of particularity is also a question of who decides. You know, again, because the framers were concerned not only about the bulkness of the collection, about its indiscriminateness, but also about who would be making choices. They didn't like the fact that once the blank check was given to the official, then he or she, well, it would be he, um, could decide what, whom to search, uh, for what, what to take. And so what that tells us is that there's a basic principle here, not only about being particular, about having some kind of selectivity, but also to make sure that we're in a position to really oversee it. Uh, we want to constrain it beforehand, and we want to make sure that once it's happened, we actually have a legal rule or a legal standard that we could say, oh, you just broke that constraint. A second principle that I think is inherent in this whole notion of the prohibition of general warrants or general searches is that of proportionality. Um, one of the things that uh, a recent National Research Council study pointed out was that even if you think about this in terms of discriminants, selectors, you've also got a problem in that even if you say, focus on, well, I'm not, I don't want everyone's phone records, I just want people in California, that's still a huge number. Uh, and given the modern bulk collection techniques, it's going to be really easy for those kinds of sort of broad discriminant collection to uh, gather up a lot of innocent people's information. So I want to move then to a more general structural principle about uh, accountability. And that has to do with the whole meaning of national security. Um, the meaning of national security is contested. It's elastic. It fits all sorts of situations. That's what the intelligence community likes about it. And that's what makes it hard for both Congress and the courts to actually control. If you say national security purposes, what does that exclude? It could be anything it, at any time. So how can you have a rule that's actually going to oversee it? Uh, this is compounded by the problems of secrecy, classification of information, which have made it almost impossible for the people to know what it is the government is doing. It even makes it hard for judges and legislators to know what, what's happening. We've had senators want to talk about what's wrong or what they think is wrong and yet be unable to do it because of national security concerns about even disclosing the information. So in sum, we've got three big issues. We've got this Fourth Amendment problem with general searches. Uh, we've also got the general privacy problem of the information that you've got. And last, you've got this big problem about how are you going to ever govern, cabin, or limit uh, the information uh, or the surveillance if you rest it on national security. I want to mention one other thing, which is that in our own litigation, EFF's litigation on this case, we've also focused on the question of First Amendment associational privacy. That is, our clients are gun groups. They're churches. These folks are chilled by not wanting, uh, by knowing that the government is actually inspecting their phone records. Who, are the, who is calling them? Who is seeking help from them? These are all issues that and I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Okay, thank you, Lee Chen. 
Um, now, again, we're talking about the government shall never engage in the bulk collection of personal data for national security purposes. And our next debater will be arguing against it, and that's Professor Orrin Kerr. Orrin? This side or the other side? This side. Uh, thank you, Lance, and my, my friends, the other debaters here, uh, for uh, being here, in particular uh, the audience members for being here. Uh, so privacy, I think we can all agree, is one of our most treasured values. Uh, it's essential to a free society. Uh, it protects our freedom of thought. It allows us to lead full and meaningful lives. Uh, at the same time, the reality is that we face security threats that might be discovered uh, and therefore stopped through some kinds of surveillance. And when deciding what kinds of surveillance our government should engage in, we have to engage in a balancing of interests. We have to assess the benefits of surveillance to the public safety and compare that to the costs of surveillance to privacy. And we should allow the surveillance when the benefits outweigh the costs and shouldn't do so when the costs outweigh the benefits. This is just a simple cost-benefit framework. I ask you to oppose the motion because it is a harsh categorical answer to a vague question that doesn't allow the kind of careful cost-benefit analysis that we need. Uh, read the proposed motion carefully. It doesn't say that bulk collection of personal data should require a warrant or that we should only engage in bulk collection of personal data when necessary. It offers instead a categorical rule. The government should never engage in bulk collection of personal data. Not ever, absolutely, categorically, no matter what. Uh, as my friend Li Tian says for the other side, they are proposing a hard rule, a hard line, never. Uh, you should not enact such a categorical rule, in particular because it's not clear what this categorical rule is. Don't ban something unless you know what it is that you are banning. Consider the category, bulk collection of personal data. First, what is bulk collection? Is bulk collection collecting data on 100 people, 1,000 people, a million people? Uh, sure, there will be some circumstances where you can say, well, wherever the line is, we can think of a case that's clearly bulk collection. But if you're considering whether to ban bulk collection of personal data, you need to make sure you know the full scope of what counts. And the nature of the phrase bulk collection is a continuum, not a dividing line. Uh, and so you should be wary about uh, uh, banning bulk collection on that ground. And what is personal data? Sure, we can think of some categories of data that count as personal data, maybe your private emails. Uh, but what about lists of who traveled outside the United States? Or who sent a particular wire transfer? What about records of non-US persons, foreigners, collected abroad? Uh, or, or consider an old-fashioned telephone, uh, telephone book. Imagine you pick up a phone book, or the, a government agent picks up a phone book. Is that bulk collection of personal data? Uh, it's, it's hard to know. The, the, the terms here are themselves vague. Even if you get past the question of definition, you should not categorically ban bulk collection of personal data because there will be programs in which those, uh, there will be programs where the benefits exceed the costs. For each program, we'd want to know exactly how it works, why it exists, how effective it is, and what are the privacy risks. That's a case-by-case -case question, and it doesn't allow for a categorical answer. Let me just give one example of what I would think is a bulk collection program of personal data for national security purposes that I think is a good program. Uh, the TSA has a program in which they collect the names and birthdays of everyone who flies on any flight, domestic or international. Sounds to me like that's bulk collection. About 1.75 million people fly a day. Uh, I think that's a good idea as a program. We all know the connection between air travel and terrorist threats. And one good way to keep bad people off airplanes is to know who wants to get on them. And the program allows that to happen. Bulk collection of personal data for national security purposes. Certainly there are other programs that may be more or less effective. Every program is going to be different. Maybe you want to say that we should uh, be skeptical of bulk collection or only allow bulk collection when the case for it is strong. Uh, but if that's your view, then you should vote against the proposal, not for the proposal. Because the proposal, again, is a hard line categorical ban on anything described as bulk collection of personal information. 
It's also important to realize that privacy can be protected downstream. A surveillance program usually works in three steps. First, the data is collected, then it is analyzed, and then information may be disclosed. Any bulk collection program should have strict limits on when the, program, when the data in the database can be queried and when it can be disclosed. Depending on the case, you might want a program in which data is collected widely, but the government needs to go to court, for example, to search the database, and there may be strict limits on disclosure of the information. That may be the proper response in a particular case in terms of the best policy to maximize the benefits of the surveillance and minimize the privacy risks. Again, that is a matter of how to have bulk collection, not whether to have bulk collection. Uh, for all these reasons, I think it's just best to never say never. Uh, we don't need a categorical ban with a vague scope that may eliminate a helpful technological tool that could counter real threats in a privacy protective way. And for these reasons, I ask you to vote no on the motion. Uh, my friend Li Tian suggests that there may be Fourth Amendment reasons, constitutional reasons, why we can't engage in bulk collection. Well, one answer to that is, of course, if there are constitutional problems with a particular scheme of bulk collection, we should not engage in that bulk collection. We can't. Uh, however, the Supreme Court's cases have allowed fairly wide-ranging surveillance uh, 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 systems on the ground that there's no search if the government is collecting non-content information. We don't need to worry about warrants, specific warrants versus general warrants, because no warrant is needed because such programs don't implicate the Fourth Amendment at all. So there are no constitutional concerns in the wide range of these cases where there are constitutional concerns. Of course, the uh, surveillance should not be allowed, but that's a question of when we should engage in bulk collection, not whether. So I urge you to oppose the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Oren. Okay, uh, as a reminder of what's going on, we're halfway through the opening round of this debate. Uh, I'm Lance Hoffman, the moderator, and we have four debaters, two against two, one lawyer and one uh, computer type on either side, um, arguing it out over this motion. The motion is, again, the government should never engage in the bulk collection of personal data for national security purposes. We've heard from the first two debaters. Now on to the third, uh, Chris Segoyan. Chris? So apparently, when you invite lawyers to a debate, they spend their time arguing over the definitions. I will not be arguing over the definitions of bulk surveillance. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us here. Every day, the telephone companies in the United States hand over records of all of their customers' telephone communications to the US government. Every day. A gigantic pile of records are provided to the NSA. And this, this database contains records that reveal who called an abortion clinic, who called a gay bookstore, who called a gun store or a suicide hotline. This database, this massive database of telephone records, a bulk telephone records database, is what uh, law professor Paul Ohm calls a database of ruin, which means that <clears throat> deep within that database is information that could sink us all, or many of us. And in fact, the telephone records database that exists and that we've learned about because of Edward Snowden is just one of many bulk records programs that the US government is engaged in. Uh, and programs like this and surveillance that occurs at this scale is problematic for several reasons. Uh, and I hope that by explaining these, I will convince you to vote yes on this motion. The first is that the internet, the internet and telephone companies that receive surveillance requests from government agencies play an important and vital role in protecting our privacy. Surveillance necessarily involves requests that do not uh, in involve the, uh, the individuals whose information is being uh, requested. When the government goes to Google and asks for a copy of your email, you cannot be present. The government doesn't want to tip off the targets the investigation. And so the only entity that can possibly be there to say no is the company. Judges are supposed to evaluate the applications, but judges are supposed to be neutral third parties. We actually want someone advocating on behalf of the privacy interests of the user, and the telephone and internet companies play that role. They play an important role as our proxies for privacy. Uh, and it's true, in many cases, these companies 
push back. Sometimes they say, you know what, this is not appropriate. They ask for the orders to be scaled back. They say that they will only hand over certain information for certain dates. And in some cases, they outright refuse and challenge the government and take these things to court. When bulk surveillance takes place, the internet and telephone companies are not able to act as our proxies. They are not able to evaluate every single bit of data that they're going to hand over and say, well, does the government need information about this person or this person? Because they're handing over everything at once, and then the government gets to query that information without that third party being able to, uh, being able to push back uh, at a later date. So that's one problem, this, this lack of a, a proxy for our interests. There's a second set of problems related to what happens once the data is in the government's hands. The first is that once you have this database, you've ha you have this data set of records, there's a huge temptation to use it in new and interesting and potentially problematic ways. So for example, GCHQ, which is the British government's intelligence agency, and NSA, the US government's foreign intelligence agency, engage in bulk, bulk collection of internet communications around the world. They, uh, they have these devices that sit at key locations at telecommunications networks around the world, and they collect everything that goes through those networks. And I think the original motivation was to collect information that it was of, of, of huge foreign intelligence uh, benefit, things related to terrorism. But once they had this information, they could start to use it in other interesting ways. So for example, over the last couple of years, because of Edward Snowden, we've learned that NSA and GCHU looked through those records to see if there were um, terrorist targets who were looking at pornography because they, they figured maybe that could be information that they could use to undermine the credibility uh, of people who are advocating for terrorism abroad. Uh, GCHQ used their gigantic pile of data to figure out which pages on Facebook were being liked more than anyone else. They built themselves a Facebook like button analytics program where they could see around the world which pages were being liked in, in real time. They also built themselves a YouTube trends platform so they could see which videos were getting hot in different regions of the world. Now maybe that's something that's useful to have and something no doubt that many people would like to have access to, but the only reason they could do it was because they had bulk access to everyone's YouTube views and everyone's Facebook likes. These are not the kinds of programs that should be, uh, that should be put in place and certainly they would have never deployed bulk surveillance just to have a Facebook-like analytics program. In addition to those sort of creeping uses, you also have the problem of misuse by agency employees. There is, there is a problem, which is that employees who have access to sensitive and salacious data sometimes look at it for their own purient reasons. And th this happens so frequently that there's a name for it in the intelligence community. It's called love int. This is what happens when an NSA employee looks through the records of their ex-girlfriend or ex-boyfriend or someone they saw on the subway that looks attractive. Uh, there, has been, uh, there have been investigations in, into these, uh, these inappropriate uses. People have been, been punished within the NSA, but no one has ever been prosecuted for engaging in love in. And so whatever system of checks and balances we have isn't working. Uh, and the third and final reason why I think that bulk collection is inappropriate is because the government cannot protect this data. This is a gigantic, sensitive database of information that shouldn't be put in one place in the first place, but cannot be defended once it's there. The US government has a woeful track record on protecting its own information. In just the last year, the White House and State Department networks have been hacked by the Russian government. Countless US government agencies and contractors have been hacked by the Chinese government, and countless US companies have been hacked by the Syrian Electronic Army uh, and other organizations. At a time when cybersecurity fears are at their high point, we should be keeping less data, not more, because once you keep it, someone will try and steal it. Again, please vote yes for the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, again, our motion is the government should never engage in the bulk collection of personal data for national security purposes. And our next debater will be arguing against it, Paul Clark. Thanks for having me. I uh, actually had to spend some fair amount of time, as Lance would know, actually figuring out and convincing myself that I was on the right side of this issue. And so to that end, um, I had to distill down the question, being a techie, of 
what the question actually is, which is, should we ever, as has been pointed out, engage in the collection for national security purposes of personal information? So while I think there are all applications of data that's collected that make us all uncomfortable, not just for national security purposes, uh, I think it's useful to instead think if there's a legitimate one, in which case the proposition that you should never do it is false. And so I turned my attention to a database that I know something about, which is the enforcement integrated database that DHS uh, keeps and includes things like the, the TSA data that my colleague was speaking of, as well as immigration, customs enforcement, border control, all kinds of enforcement data that people who have are detained or arrested by agencies of DHS is collected in a database. And um, I'm actually, in the interest of full disclosure, involved in litigation to cause them to tell us exactly what the data, data types are and what the fields of that database are. Having said that, I do not believe that we would be any safer or any better off if we simply deleted that data. In fact, if there is a crisis, and most of us in the audience are old enough to remember at least one, um, it would actually be irresponsible, in my view, to have deleted that data rather than having controlled access to it. So if we think about uh, data that agencies reasonably need to, to do their jobs, I mean, we all know the IRS has certain data that they keep on us, and uh, you know, it'd be pretty good from my view if that didn't get released. There are strict laws which control access to it. Social Security Administration has medical data and other types of data on us. They reasonably need that data to perform their mission. So the question is, does DHS, in order to perform its mission, need to maintain this type of bulk collection data to perform its mission? I, I think unequivocally, I can say yes. That if, if there is a crisis, it's going to be the, an attack or a threat of an attack that is of sufficient urgency that we want to know who the bad guys are. And not only do we not want to throw away the data on the bad guys, we want to know who went and visited the bad guys in jail, who got them out of jail. And, and we need to have that data preserved in order to respond to such a crisis. So what um, my opponent said that the aggregation of data cannot be defended, uh, I actually take some issue with. If you aggregate the data and instead put strict controls on it, rather than leaving it out at various agencies where it is more likely to be subverted, I believe that you can protect privacy and you can actually manage through legislation access to that data. And furthermore, you can run analytics on that data after it's been de-identified. I can actually remove, as they do with healthcare data, for purposes of running analytics. And then in the event that a severe flag is raised, then I could submit that for approval to go back and remap it to the individual data. This is all technically possible. It's all being done right now with healthcare data. And I think that we don't want to confuse the management of access to data with the collection of data. If, if we simply delete the data, that is we don't collect it, rather than strictly legislating access, we will have essentially disarmed ourselves from being able to respond to what we know can be very severe threats. Thank you, Paul. Um, okay, well now move on to a little back and forth uh, among the debaters. Uh, and let me start with tossing out a first question, and then they can go back and forth. I'll try to moderate. We'll go for a few minutes this way, and then open up to the uh, audience for uh, your questions. Um, but start, Paul. You sort of made a. You said something about okay, we can aggregate the data and then uh, de-aggregate it if we have to down the road. And I'm wondering if that's really if the other side would really agree with that, or they have some issues with that. And this also gets the issue of. The, the proposition, do you, 
put controls on or, or can you even effectively put controls on a time of collection versus time of use? And that sort of thing. So I wonder what the response is of uh, Lee or Chris. So we hear this argument very frequently from both people in the government and people in the private sector. Don't worry, the data is anonymous. It doesn't put anyone's privacy at risk. We hear this from the, from the government in, in defense of the 215 program. It's just telephone numbers. There's no names attached. Of course, they have phone book, reverse phone books like the rest of us do. They can type a telephone number into Google or they can send a subpoena or an NSL to the phone company. But they say, no, no, don't worry. It's just telephone numbers. Internet advertising companies will say, don't worry, we don't know who these people are, they're just unique identifiers that, are, that we put into the cookies. But of course, there are advertising companies that link those cookies back to people's names. There is a, a strong body of research showing that it is extremely difficult to de-identify data and, and that the research is moving in the direction of re-identification. That means if you have a database of information that has allegedly been uh, anonymized or de-identified, researchers are finding more and more ways that you can tie that anonymous data back to someone's name. There have been uh, a number of top, uh, top research projects done by, by people like Latanya Sweeney at Harvard, uh, who was until last year the chief technologist at the FTC. There have been countless real databases that have been re-identified, and you know, the progress of, of knowledge and research is going in one direction, which is less and less anonymity and more and more re-identification. So uh, yeah, I'd like to respond to that. Uh, actually, uh, the de-identification uh, that I was speaking with uh, and the inference problem that my uh, opponent correctly points out uh, actually have been known since the early 80s when a good friend of ours, Dorothy Denning, published her book about the data inference problems within databases. And in order to infer, you must have a sufficient number of records in order to do that. So if you de-identify the data before it goes out, and if the data such as the DHS database that I used as an example, which is not internet connected, is not searchable, and you export that data uh, in the appropriate way, it will not be able to be re-identified. And because you have to ha simply need enough records and enough information in those records to re-identify it. So if I remove name, date of birth, social security number from uh, people who are arrested's records, the rest of you know, location and, and gender information and, uh, and anonymous linkages between those records do not actually make it easy to re-identify at all. Uh, let me give it back to this side now, if you want to uh, ask a question of the other side or respond further. Well, I'd just like to point out that uh, a lot of, most of the re-identification re and de-identification issue really rests in how much other information is available, right? You can never tell simply by looking at the data set. What you have to take into account of is what other data is out there. Um, and in the context of our debate, which has to do with the uh, actual, with the bulk collection for national security purposes, I think I have to assume that when we're talking about the ability of the intelligence community and the national security establishment to re-identify or to actually use that kind of data, um, they have already have their hands on an enormous amount of data, even without bulk collection techniques. Um, plus, some data is simply, I mean, it's hard to, say, de-identify DNA. It's hard to de-identify de location records. The most recent studies show that something like f uh, a minimal set of four location points uh, and this is taken from uh, studies involving uh, cell phone, uh, mobile phone location, is enough to uniquely identify uh, individuals, at least inside the United States. So the amount of data that's needed to really penetrate a lot of these, uh, the supposed uh, anonymity protections in these data sets is, is very, very small. And when you look at the threat model, which is 
the intelligence community being able to use this data. I think it's very, very difficult to actually, uh, for them to ever claim that they would not be able to actually identify people. Let me ask this side over here, uh, Paul and Orrin. Would this change significantly if the proposition were not about the government, but were about uh, the private sector? In terms of collection? So, so you're asking, w would the merits of the question change if it were private sector, yes. bulk collection of personal data for national security purposes? Ah, that's good. You go with what you want for that. So, well, this is, um, I mean, I, my, my instincts are, are the same. That ne never say never. We, we need to analyze the merits of any particular program on a case-by-case -case basis, looking at the actual data that's being collected, how it can be secured, how it may not be secured, what are the risks, what's the oversight, uh, what are the audit systems that are in place. It, it, we need that on a case-by-case -case basis. It, it, I mean, I, I think the default, of course, in the context of private sector collection is that unless the law steps in and says you can't do it, uh, you know, pr private companies, that's just a matter of they can collect information from their customers, usually pursuant to some sort of consent, or they, you know, have, have somehow registered with a private company and they, they are giving their data to the company. Um, so it, it, I think it all just depends on the case. We, we shouldn't be answering this question in bulk, maybe is the best way of thinking about it. We need a, a, a granular answer to each program and, and to figure out whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, moreover, uh, in order to find against the proposition, you only need to find one counterexample. I'll point out that the database um, that I've been talking about includes no cell phone records. It simply keeps information on known bad guys. And so to that end, in order, we only need to look at one legitimate use of this information in order to find against the proposition. Does this change? Oh, go ahead, Chris. So after you guys vote a second time, the votes will be counted and then it'll be put onto the internet. And we're having a, an in-depth debate here, a, con a, a refined debate with, uh, with my opponents, you know, delving into these, these small programs like TSA's database. But when, if you vote for them, when this is printed on the internet, it won't be you know, an audience at George Washington favors bulk collection of a limited database maintained by TSA. You have to understand the greater context that this debate is taking place in. Right now, the law that the government is using to collect bulk telephone records is expiring. There's, there are debates on the Hill today to discuss whether or not this law should be renewed, whether or not the government, whether or not federal agencies should have the ability to go to private parties and compel the disclosure of all records about their customers. And so whatever you do today will play a part in that debate, in that broader political debate. This isn't about TSA collecting names and telephone numbers. This isn't about uh, US customs collecting information. This debate at its core is about secret databases maintained by the government compelling third parties into handing over our private data to the government. This is not about someone filling out a form at the airport. All right, and so uh, be very, very careful. Do not let the other side twist this and, and, so, and make you think that, oh, I guess there's this one database that the government keeps that sort of sounds okay, so therefore I'm gonna bless what, what they're saying. This is a chance for you to say no to what the NSA is doing, and so please vote yes. Before I was a law professor, I was a prosecutor at the Justice Department, did a couple jury trials, uh, and there's a, a name that lawyers have for the argument that Chris just made, and it's called jury nullification. Uh, that is, don't answer the question before you think of the symbol that your decision will send to the public at large. Uh, I think we're here to answer the question before us, which is should the government ever engage in bulk collection of personal data for national security purposes? And you should focus on that question, not whether you like Section 215, whether you want to send a message to President Obama, uh, whatever your broader views are, this should be focused on the question before us today. Well, let me, I've, I've got to respond to that. I mean, the, again, I, uh, I keep going back to the Constitution. Uh, and the reason I keep going back to the Constitution is because I think that it represents 
sort of the basic charter for our principles. And one of those basic principles is that we don't actually trust the government to do the right thing. That's why we have separation of powers. That's why the executive branch is not supposed to be a king. That's why Congress is supposed to make laws and the courts are supposed to figure out whether or not things are actually in accordance with the law and with the Constitution. Now, Orrin and Paul have been talking about, gee, you know, you've got to look at this uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but, you know, like I said at the beginning, looking at things at a case-by-case -case basis is kind of what got us to this state right now. We are debating the question of whether or not the government should be engaging ever in bulk collection because we've never actually apparently said the government never should and so uh, as the executive branch and especially the national security establishment is wont to do, they have taken what seems to be a soft spot and just run the hell out of it uh, and they will continue to do that and that's why I keep saying you know, if you are looking at what the rule should be, what our principle should be, then it should be no, because that doesn't give them the flexibility to choose to do things, which I might add, obviously, they have been doing in secret because, precisely because they do not want actually the public and the courts and the Congress in full knowledge to understand what's going on. In fact, I don't know how we can even do the kind of granular case-by-case -case analysis that uh, Oren and Paul are talking about if we don't have facts about what the government is doing and we don't have a clear understanding of what the rules of the game are. We have seen with the 215 program, just as an example, that the, the law which contained the word relevance, which has always been understood to actually limit what the government is supposed to be able to collect, as opposed to collecting everything, got turned into a blank check to collect all or as many telephone records as they could on the rationale that only by having it all would you be able to trace certain kinds of patterns. So the entire tone of this exceptions-based argument is actually to create a loophole that the intelligence community has. and. Uh, will continue to exploit unless it's closed. I agree with a lot of what Lee just said about transparency and disclosure. I think it's absolutely essential that the public debate these questions as we are here. Uh, I think uh, it's important that Congress now knows that the Section 215 telephony metadata program is existing. Uh, that authority is about to sunset. It will sunset on June 1st. Uh, and Congress will decide whether they want to reauthorize it. And I think we should uh, harshly criticize the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court for approving a program based on, to my mind, a fairly flimsy statutory interpretation. They basically allowed this program uh, based on a reading of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Laws, which you couldn't have gotten if you just read the text. And that's what the text is there for, to, to limit the executive branch. So, so I agree the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court was uh, 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 improperly read the statute and we should criticize them for it and that we should have a public debate about the nature of these programs. But again, and, and I hate to be the, the law professor, but I guess that's my role. Um, w that's a question about how we should do bulk collection. That's not a question of whether to do bulk collection or, or at least the question of disclosure is separate from the merits of the idea of the program. So I, I join Lee in, in saying that this should be a public debate, uh, and it shouldn't be a secret program, uh, but I still think we need to debate each program, and the way to do that is to do so publicly, but still to not have a categorical, categorical ban. Can, can I just quickly add something, which is that Oren's using program in the singular, but there are many programs, and we only know about one of them. We, the government has said that there are other bulk, there are other bulk collection programs that are taking place using 215, but we don't know what they are. They've said that the majority of the 215 orders relate to some kind of cybersecurity program, but we have no idea what kind of data they're collecting and who they're collecting it from. They're likely collecting hotel records and records of certain kinds of purchases from certain merchants. I mean, two years on, two years after Snowden, we still don't even have an idea as to how they're using this much debated law. And so I think the point from that is that 
they're not going to tell us ever. The only reason we know about the telephone program is because of Edward Snowden. In unless we have a whistleblower every year, we are not going to learn about the, the basics of the bulk collection programs that the government is using. The only way that we can control them is to say no to bulk surveillance. Because after the program has come into existence, they, they live in the shadows. So I, as a techie and a linear thinker, I, I think I've heard the question we're debating changed a few times um, to a point that we can all agree on, which is we're all uncomfortable with bulk surveillance. Uh, we're all uncomfortable with government agencies not having access to data that they need to perform their missions. Um, I heard, I think, um, Lee say that uh, the default should be no. I, I think that's probably a reasonable position. The question before us is, should it ever happen? And to convince myself of that, I found a, a program that I believe is still on the table that doesn't require uh, cell phone records. It doesn't. It, is it subject to abuse? To be sure. But I think that eliminating data rather than managing access to it needlessly disarms us. And I think that we can all construct an example, you know, however severe you need to make it, where we're willing to surrender privacy rights in order to protect ourselves. So deleting the data would prevent us from doing that rather than managing it. Let me ask one more question, starting with uh, this side, but then we'll get to your questions. So think about questions you may wish to ask, um, and also we're going to have the second vote in uh, a few minutes. And to that, I ask my uh, SFS students to hopefully they've tallied the first vote and to come down and give them to me when I'm not doing this, uh, so I know what the first vote was at least. Um, okay, um, would this change at all? Fast forward, we're already in this. Um, mode, but fast forward 10 years where we've got the Internet of Things really big time, and everything is talking to every other thing. Does this change your argument at all? Make it worse? Make it better? Are there other opportunities for your side to prevail uh, in this new environment or not? I have uh, an Internet-connected thermostat in my house, and uh, at some point, I will likely have an internet-connected uh, home surveillance system surveilling people trying to get into the house. Uh, I will likely have an internet-connected washing machine at some point in the future, and um, I'm fighting the urge, but eventually I will probably have an internet-connected TV. And all of these devices are creating data that can be used to reveal when I'm home, when I'm not at home, who I'm at home with, what I'm doing in my house. Uh, and this is data that doesn't reside in my home. This is data that leaves my house and enters the databases of third-party companies like Google and Facebook and Microsoft. Uh, these companies pledge that they will protect my privacy. They pledge that they will um, evaluate every request that comes in and push back against requests that seem unreasonable. But they cannot push back on bulk orders if courts rule that those bulk orders are lawful. And so we may move to a point in the future where Nest, which is owned by Google, has to hand over bulk records of everyone's home power usage, revealing when they leave, when they come back, uh, when they decide to turn the temperature up and down. Uh, we may move to a point where Google's, Google also owns a, a home, uh, home surveillance camera uh, service as well. Those, that camera footage may be uh, handed over in bulk. I, I think the Internet of Things really just moves us to a world where the government has so much more data. And if bulk surveillance of telephone communications is possible, if bulk surveillance of location data is lawful, then I don't see why bulk surveillance of power usage wouldn't be lawful. I don't see why bulk surveillance of uh, transit system movement wouldn't be lawful. And I think that's information that the government hasn't had in the past at that scale, and it's information they shouldn't have in the future. Uh, I don't want to live in that kind of world. Uh, Certainly, I didn't sign up for that, and my member hasn't voted in favor of that. And I just think it allows the government to have too much information about too many people who've done nothing to deserve that level of, of inquiry into their private lives. Do you yeah. mind if I add to that before? Go ahead. Yeah, so the, the, the thing that, that's interesting here is that uh, 
there will be much more data. Uh, of course, there is already an enormous amount of, of data to go after. The, the thing that we haven't talked about, and, and, but that will, I think, become more clear uh, with more data, is how much more data there will be available without engaging in bulk collection. And, you know, because the, the question is really, can we do things the right way? And it will actually, I think, as a practical matter, uh, I mean, we can do things the right way now, but it will actually, or it may actually be easier to do things in a targeted way. For the government. Yes, yes, for the government. And so right now, the way that the debate is being framed, it's sort of like, well, gee, gee, if they can't do that, then we'll lose X, Y, and Z. Uh, it's actually sort of hard for me to, to, to gauge, because I think the, the privacy threat is far, far greater with much, much more granular uh, transactional data created by the Internet of Things. But at the same time, uh, it may actually be easier for the government's, say, investigative needs to be satisfied without engaging in this sort of poisonous uh, tool. Uh, unfortunately, we're in the current situation, we're all being sort of told, or at least being led to fear, that things will be lost that we must not lose uh, if we don't do this, uh, even though, quite frankly, we have very little idea what the delta is between the bulk surveillance uh, and a surveillance that would not be bulk. Um, they are not telling us that. Uh, I actually have a, a lot of skepticism about whether there's anything much to lose at all. When I think of the impact of the Internet of Things on this question, I think, okay, there's going to be a lot more information that's going to be collected by private parties that will be out there, regardless of what the government does. Uh, and then the question is, are there any data sets where some sort of widespread collection of that data set would have a substantial role in advancing public safety and yet not pose a significant security threat? Um, I don't know what those data sets would be. If the question is, you know, what, what uh, is, is your thermostat connected to the internet? I can't imagine how bulk collection of thermostat data is going to somehow protect the country against terrorist threats. And my position is not that we should engage in bulk collection of everything, remember. It's just, should we ever have any kind of bulk collection? So the availability of new kinds of data, uh, I'm not suggesting there should be bulk collection of that. That's, that's just a question. Of, of what the private sector is doing outside of this. I, I, I did want to uh, address uh, Chris's point. Uh, Chris says that it's better to have the government going to the private party and seeking collection uh, piece by piece of, of information because the private party can fight that acquisition of the information. Uh, and that if you have bulk collection, then the private party is no longer able to do that. And, and I disagree with that for a couple of reasons. One is that, of course, the private party can fight the bulk collection. Uh, there are still continuing orders, typically, which are requiring the private parties to hand over the information, and they can fight those. Uh, and then also, once the information is collected by the government, you can have significant legal regulation of government access to the database. So, for example, in the Section 215 program, uh, the, the way the program works now, the government goes to a court, goes to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and says, we want to send the following query, and then the court will approve or disapprove the court order in that context. Essentially, kind of like the traditional warrant procedure where a government official has to go to a judge. And we can argue about what the standard should be for querying the database, <laughs> uh, but that's the, the pushback is from the judge who says, you have to satisfy the standard to get access to the database. And that's essentially the same privacy protection regardless of whether the government has the database or the private sector has the database. And, and I think it's a fair question, which is the more or less secure approach? Are private companies that have a, data, a database in their, uh, you know, on their servers, are, are, are they more or less secure than the NSA keeping it uh, 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 where they may have invested more resources and have more of an incentive to resource, uh, invest resources on the security of their data. So it's not clear to me there's actually that much of a difference between bulk collection where the government goes and gets a court order versus the private companies keeping the data and then the government getting the data on a more individualized basis. 
Can I push back against Oren's point since he sure. called me out by name? <laughs> it's fine. Um, the way that Oren describes it, the government collects this information under somewhat suspicious circumstances, but then they have this strict set of rules that govern when they, they look through it. And those rules can act as a sufficient check and balance to make up for the, the total absence of, of effective rules at, at the front. Uh, it's true that with the 215 program, it has been blessed by the, uh, the secret FISA court, but that is not the only bulk surveillance program that the NSA operates. In fact, the most problematic bulk surveillance database that the NSA operates is one called X Keyscore, which is a bulk surveillance database of internet communications collected around the world, and no judge has to evaluate or sign off on queries through X Keyscore. It's through that database that the NSA and GCHU looked for records of people looking at pornography. It's through that database that GCHU and NSA stalked and hunted engineers at Gemalto, a uh, Dutch French manufacturer of SIM cards, so they could then hack into that company and, and steal encryption keys. It's through that database that much of what NSA does is possible. Uh, the surveillance that NSA conducts abroad, which is bulk surveillance at its largest scale, uh, is really a system with no checks and balances. It is the wild west of surveillance. Um, and what it demonstrates is that these rules don't, don't come along automatically. They have to be put into place. And we are going to get the fewest rules over bulk surveillance programs uh, as opposed to an individual requests for individual users' data. Everything that NSA does, I think, terrifies me. But of all the things that they do, the, the collection under Executive Order 12333, of which X key score is one component, that is the part that, that really terrifies me. And I think it should terrify us all because we know so little about it. There are no FISA court orders authorizing it. There are no uh, FISA court search warrants authorizing searches through it. It's just a massive pool of data and, the, and government agents can just put a net in and, and pull stuff out. And it turns out when you have this gigantic data set of people's emails and web browsing records and other private information, there's gonna be some useful stuff in there. Uh, but it's too attractive. It's too tempting for them to use it. There's always one more use. There's always one more interesting thing they can search for, and there are so few controls over the collection or the, or the use. Okay, Paul, you get the last word. If you want to uh, Yeah, questions. as the tech yet, I think we've gone off course again, but I wanted to say in support of what Oren was saying that uh, absolutely unequivocally I can tell you that a private company connected to the internet with internet connected databases is less secure than a physically secured facility with a database that is not connected to the outside network. Okay, thank you. And with that, um, we'll move on to the questions. If you have a question, I hope some of you do, please, uh, we have some microphones. Where are they? Who has, oh, okay. So we have some microphones in the back. Please raise your hand and uh, somebody will uh, come down and approach you and give you the microphone, and uh, you will be uh, uh, recorded and video recorded as well. Please state your uh, name and uh, aff affiliation. Uh, take the time, the, the rest who are waiting, uh, take the time to concisely formulate your question before you ask it. Make sure it's short, brief, concise. Um, it's not a speech, but a question. Um, and I will uh, stop there uh, and um, go for the questions. Okay. I'm Jason Cannon with a sort of privacy. Um, today we have cameras in airports, malls, stadiums, collecting information to everybody that walks by. There's been talk about government expanding that so you can actually have more cameras in public. Now, understanding that those kind of cameras could have unraveled this mystery around Trayvon Martin and the Jefferson, Missouri incidents, would you be against that as well? Um, Chris and Lee. All right, so I didn't hear all of the question, but I, you want to repeat it real quickly? Yeah, bulk collection via cameras in public. But government owned cameras or private owned cameras? Are you holding the, the microphone, by the way? I can't no, tell. Now he's, now he's empty handed. Well, let's I, do I, one I more. I think I got the question. So they could uncover yeah. mysteries right. that, that exist that did have cameras 
Would you be against that type of collection? So I, I think the thing is that I don't think there's anyone on stage here who would, who's, who would say that bulk surveillance data wouldn't be useful to the government. Right? It, let's just use this as a, as a thought experiment. If the police could kick down any door they wanted and search any home any time, they would certainly be able to catch more bad guys. That I don't think there, there's, there's anyone who would say, no, no, it would actually make it more difficult for the police to catch bad guys. If they could search everyone all the time, you know, search people on the street, search their bags, search their computers, search their houses, with no court order, with no judicial supervision, of course it would be easier for the police to catch bad guys. And of course, there are more bad guys sorry, on the give, street give today. Give him the microphone, please. There are more okay. bad guys on the street today because the police have to follow rules and get warrants. But our founding fathers didn't want that kind of system. You shifted the question. All right, hold on. We're going to go. We're not going we, well, to get one question. We'll be another 30 yeah. seconds there. Yeah, just another public. One minute here, and then we're going to go. Public surveillance. Question. I didn't say kicking down any doors. Well, no, what I'm, what I'm saying is we can make the, the government's job easier by removing all of our privacy protections, but our founding fathers didn't want that. And, you know, there are countries where there are cameras on every corner, the UK being one of them. Uh, and the UK and, and Singapore, which also has them, they're both police states. And you know, I, I'm not terribly excited about the prospect of living in a world where a camera captures every single movement, every person I'm holding hands with, every person I whisper into their ear or kiss them on the cheek. I think there are private moments that the government should never be able to, to monitor. And yeah, you're right. We're, we're, we're heading into a world with more cameras, some of which are going to be installed by the government, some of which are going to be installed you know, when there's a Super Bowl or a, a political um, convention in your town and suddenly DHS pays for cameras everywhere. And some of the cameras are going to be because we install them or because businesses install them and they'll be centralized and, and data will be pooled and the government will be able to um, obtain that. And that terrifies me. Right, and I think that we, we should make it more difficult for the state and we should require that they have to get individualized warrants for individual sets of data because otherwise it, it takes us down this, this terrible path to a surveillance state. Okay, let's move on to another, another, hopefully another question. If not, I'll have to ask one, I guess, or uh, Ernest down in front. Uh, Ernest McDuffie, CEO of the Global McDuffie Group. Uh, so I've, I've done a, a lot of work in cybersecurity issues, actually worked for NSA uh, as a, uh, I, I guess, a, a, a disclaimer. You know, you know I, I have a, a military background. So the, the thing that, that this question does for me is, you know, you, the focus on never, I, I think that's a, a big point. I, I hate anything. Again, Ernest, it's never. not a speech, it's a question. No, I know. The, the que so the question is, what do you do about the bad guys in the world? We're kind of coaching the government as being the bad guys. You know, I take that you can't, you can't trust the government to some extent. That's why the checks and balances are part of the system, so that there is some degree of trust. But you certainly can't trust the bad guys. All the technology that you're talking about is out there and available to them, and they're going to use it regardless of what you do on any of the laws. So your so what's effect, your question? The effect is: do you, do you feel that the handicapping of the government in the in the fact in the face of the, the threats and knowing what out there is worth it? Is it worth is it worth the risk of multiple 9/11s every day because you didn't do bulk collection? Okay, Lee, you want to try that? Well, you know, there's a, you know, as Chris was saying, one of the basic issues here is how much are you actually going to take away um, the restrictions that we have had on government? I mean, the, you know, the, it is, you know, I, I'm repeating what Chris said, but it's always going to be easier if you make, you can always make it easier on the government, right? Uh, and you will have, presumably, some increase, perhaps, in uh, crime fighting or terrorism fighting uh, capacity. You know, but we're not saying, and the proposition doesn't require us to disarm ourselves in terms of fighting crime or terrorism. It is only saying that the thing that one of the key things that this country was founded on, um, the idea that you do not have 
bulk collection, that you do not have general warrants and general searches, that you do not have indiscriminate exercise of surveillance power by the government, especially when it's in the hands of individual agents who can do what they want. That's the proposition we've got here. And I think that it's uh, actually giving the uh, NSA and giving the, the bad guys way, way too much credit uh, to suggest that the only way that we can, as a society, as a nation, as a world, actually live is by becoming a surveillance state. I mean, that's, it's, it's a, I don't like slippery slope arguments, but bulk collection is you know, sort of in, it, in and of itself the end of the slippery slope. Okay. It is to say that you can collect indiscriminately without regard to whether people have done anything right. Lee, wrong. Lee, I'm going to stop you now because- So I'll, I'll just stop there. Because you have a closing argument coming up. Uh, is there anybody with a question for the other side here? Uh, thank you. My question is mostly for Professor Kerr. Identify yourself first. Uh, William Yeomans. I'm a faculty member at the School of Media and Public Affairs. Uh, without getting into the, you know, the, the specific word of never, I'm interested in your idea of a cost-benefit sort of approach. Um, you know, almost like an actuarial kind of approach looking at a calculation of risk. Is there a threshold of risk that you have in mind that would justify uh, that kind of program, like a, like a, you know, some sort of cut-off level where, where the, the uh, benefit justifies the kind of cost? Because um, that's, that's the kind of the conversation that I think your point would have to get us into. So I, it's, it's, it's kind of a va vague question, but if you could give me a sense of what kind of ratio you think would be uh, ideal. Great. Um, so I think that there's so many uncertainties about the nature of the security threat, about whether any particular tool is going to be useful, was useful in the past, may be useful in the future, uh, what the security risks might end up being, will information be disclosed, to what extent, what security mechanisms are the best ways. That we're, we're, I, it's, it's hard to make it, it's sort, sort of hard to go to numbers because of the uncertainties. What I'm thinking is more just from a, a, a just sort of almost a common sense sense of, okay, we, we might engage in a surveillance program. Is this gonna be worth it? Is it gonna work, first of all? I mean, it may be that a particular surveillance program just doesn't work. It ends up, it doesn't particularly yield helpful intelligence information, and then it should be stopped. On the other hand, it may be that the program say, wait a minute, this actually is really valuable. This turns out to be an effective way of finding, whether it's terrorist cells or transactions, uh, financial transactions, or whatever, whatever the, the thing is that the government is looking for. And, and so we just, for each, we, we should never think, oh, well, categorically we want bulk surveillance or we don't want bulk surveillance. Just, just what kind of surveillance? What kind of information? How's it going to be protected? And that we need to always be kind of keeping that cost-benefit issue in mind. Paul, you want to respond to that or has Oren said what you want to say? No, I've already said that. You've already said it. Okay. Um, I see no other questions, so I'm going to move on. Um, I want to thank you all for your questions so far. We're now going to hear the closing statements which will be very brief, just one minute each, one minute each, and four minutes from now, we'll be voting. So remember how you voted before? Maybe your mind has changed, maybe it hasn't. Um, and two minutes after that, we'll get the results. So let's go to uh, the first person, the closing argument. Again, the motion is the government should never engage in the bulk collection of personal data for national security purposes. And here to summarize his position supporting the motion is Lee Ken. Lee? So I think uh, since it's a summer, you have heard this all before. Um, you know, in, uh, in a recent case, uh, the government argued that there were all sorts of protocols that it could use in order to minimize the privacy harms of uh, searching cell phones incident to arrest. And the, uh, then the court ended up saying, you know, the government proposes that law enforcement agencies develop protocols to address the con concerns raised by cloud computing. Probably a good idea, 
but the founders did not fight a revolution to gain the right to government agency protocols. Um, what we've got here is a, is a discussion that really focuses on particular programs, but the fact is we have to ask whether what the government should be able to do in general. And what we have seen is that when the government has this power, or thinks it has this power, it abuses it. And that's exactly what the Constitution says we're not supposed to allow it to do. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Lee. Uh, okay, uh, Oren, you wanna summarize your... Uh... The premise of this debate is that we've entered a pretty scary world, scary in two different ways, scary in the sense that the threat of uh, security harms is, is real, and also scary in the sense that the privacy harms, uh, uh, the privacy threats are real. Uh, we've entered a world of data, and we're trying to figure out what to do with that world of data. There's just so much information out there, and as we look out into the future, there's just more and more information available, and we're just trying to figure out what do we do with that? What, is, what should the government have access to? Under what conditions? Uh, my view ultimately is you should vote against the proposal because we shouldn't shut the door uh, to whatever counts as bulk collection of personal data. Uh, we should look at each case on a case-by-case -case basis and not foreclose the possibility some of these programs are gonna be pretty effective and useful and therefore worth it. Thank you. When, when Section 215 of the Patriot Act was passed, the public was told that it would be used to get records from rental car companies. The big debate at the time was over whether the law could be used to get library records. The American public was never told that this law would be used to get telephone records in bulk. Uh, the only reason we know about this bulk telephone records program is because of Edward Snowden, and we still don't know about several other programs that the US government is operating. The fact is, we are never going to be told about the bulk surveillance programs that are the most problematic. We don't get to have a fine-grained analysis or to do a case-by-case -case analysis because we are not part of that discussion. As citizens of this country, the only way we get to have a voice is at the high level. The only way we get to say no is to say no to all bulk collection because we're not going to be in the room when these secret interpretations of the laws, of our existing laws, are getting discussed and, and approved. The way to say no to the most problematic bulk surveillance programs is to say no to all bulk surveillance. And so I ask you, please vote yes. First, thanks uh, for having me. I've, I've actually really enjoyed this. Um, I, I think that the argument as it was originally posed and presented, still comes down to the fact, is there a case when it should be allowed? I've presented one. My opponents, have none of them have told you that that database should be deleted. Not one of them. And I think that there are, in order to perform the operations of these agencies, legitimate reasons for them to collect data. And so the question is whether that data should be retained for national security purposes. I, I didn't hear anybody say that it should be deleted. Thanks. Okay, <clears throat> thank you all. And now it's time to learn which side has argued most persuasively. We're gonna ask you to go ahead and go to your three by five cards, which you have, the other set of three by five cards, and vote a second time. Remember, it's the team whose numbers have changed the most in percentage points uh, between the opening and closing, which will be declared the winner. If you agree with the motion that the government should never engage in the bulk collection of personal data for national security purposes, we're asking you to check the agree box. If you disagree, check disagree. If you remain uh, undecided or became undecided, check the undecided box. Pass the three by five cards, uh, when you, once you check them, over to the aisle again, where some of our students will come by and collect them again and bring them to a central place, count them very quickly, um, and then uh, we'll uh, announce the results in, in really just a couple of minutes. So uh, everybody have their votes done? You can't vote the second time if you didn't vote the first time, by the way. Um, okay, pass, pass them over to the uh, aisle. 
And then once you, you guys get done counting them in the back, just bring up to me the uh, uh, results up here. In the meantime, in the meantime I will um, uh, mention it's been really fascinating to see these four experts uh, talk uh, uh, amongst each other in, 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 in a very respectful and civil way about this, even though they disagree with each other. Let's give them a round of applause for their efforts. Okay, and while we're doing that, uh, a word from our sponsor. Uh, I have to vamp for a couple minutes while the votes are being counted. So I thought I would talk just a bit about uh, the Institute, the Cybersecurity Policy and Research Institute, which I direct, which is one of the uh, uh, sponsors of the university seminar series, or one of the con con organizations along with SMPA and the School of Media and Public Affairs and the Elliott School of International Affairs and the Law School, who are, uh, bring this uh, to you. Um, CSPRI, the Cybersecurity Policy and Research Institute, is in the School of Engineering and Applied Science, but we really do all of the missions of the university in terms of research and education and service. We, is, we have projects in each, as you can see there. Uh, indeed, this project is one of them. If uh, I can ask the mouse click, uh, mouse click on the first slide, on the first uh, blue bottom there, the blue box, the University Seminar on Internet of Freedom and Governments, that's what this is. You see the mouse creeping up there? And in a moment, you may have seen this. And, and now, talk about recursion. Uh, this is a live stream of a live stream or something like that. This is pretty cool. Um, so that's this project. And then if you would um, uh, go back, please, to the original, uh, that slide. Thank you. We also have a scholarship program. Many of the students here are in the CyberCore scholarship program. Uh, it right now supports uh, students in four different schools of the 10 schools of the university. And uh, next year, it'll likely support uh, students in five schools of the university. And that's uh, really quite something, because cybersecurity really is interdisciplinary. And cybersecurity and privacy, closely related, as you can tell, uh, really are um, um, important, interesting, and so uh, interdisciplinary and multifaceted. We do, that's the uh, website of the CyberCore uh, Scholarship for Service program up there. And if I can go back to the uh, original one, do you have the results? Ah, the results are in, okay. We go back to the original slide then, of uh, the sponsor slide, come on up uh, and let me see these. Okay, now I get to reveal, um, in the beginning, we started out, and again, the proposition uh, is the government should never engage in the bulk collection of personal data for national security purposes, okay. Never, never engage in it. At the beginning, believe it or not, the, uh, of the uh, 20 people that voted, okay, it was basically even. There were seven yes, and seven no, and six maybe. Okay, that was in the beginning. Now, at the end, there, uh, there, there was only one maybe. And uh, there were now, at the end, there were six yes, and 11 no. So the no's have won, okay? So congratulations to the no's and congratulations to everybody. Give them another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much for attending. Uh, this will conclude the uh, main live portion of the debate and if you wanna come down and meet the speakers or talk to them, they'll be here for a few minutes. Thanks very much.